Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to yet another edition of Lima Online. Um, for tonight's edition, I gave carte blanche, so to say, to Josephine Bosma, and I'm very happy she said yes. Um, Josephine is an art critic and a theorist with a strong focus and a whole lot of knowledge on net art. And she has invited Nancy Monroe Flute, and a performance artist and a researcher at RMIT University Australia, and Winnie Soon, an artist researcher at Aarhus University in Denmark. Uh, both Nancy and Winnie are researching the impact of digital culture and digital communication on human race, so to say, and, to, and they are fighting for a more human internet by using feminist and queer art practices. Um, so yeah, tonight they will talk with Josephine about all this. And I think um, now it's just my time to um, invite them to the screen. And yeah, Nancy, Winnie and Josephine, thank you so much for um, taking this invitation and engaging in conversation here tonight. So Josephine, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Sonica. Thank you very much, Aliba, for inviting me. Uh, it's, it's really an honor um, because I think that uh, what you've put together here in the past few months is uh, admirable, it's, it's very good, and it shows the potential that the internet still has, even with something as, um, well, uh, critical as Zoom. I think uh, it's not the perfect interface for uh, these things. I have been told this is my first time using it even because of uh, all this criticism that I heard. Mm. So um, it's, it's funny to, to do this. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about online presentations because I've been getting a few questions about them and about the whole uh, uh, especially cultural part of society, arts institutions and so on, moving online and people doing online work. And that was allegedly good for net art. Um, there are, of course, uh, some, there, there, is, uh, there are some positive sides to it, uh, but with online presentations, I, I do hope that they continue. I do hope uh, Lima Online continues, but uh, I am a little fearful of online presentations, uh, getting a kind of professionalism, uh, becoming um, a little bit like uh, television and radio. You know, uh, the internet is moving in that direction direction anyway. But what's good about the, the type of presentation that we do now is it's low uh, tech, uh, relatively low tech and low key and uh, low budget. Uh, uh, I can't, sorry, it's somehow I can't find my words tonight. But I, I guess you understand what I mean. So um, while I think it's wonderful that there are so many online presentations now, I do hope that uh, we are not at the beginning of a time where all art institutions uh, are gathering big budgets to make wonderful studios uh, where uh, they suck up a lot of um, uh, not just funding, but also uh, audience because they just managed to gather more uh, equipment and uh, more uh, broadcast power, so to say. Um, so this is something that I would like if there's any people from funding bodies watching now or just uh, critics in, in general, um, this is something to keep in mind, I suppose. Um, because that's, that's really, the, the, the liveliness and the, uh, the, the development of internet culture and of culture at large is very much dependent on these bottom-up projects and the smaller uh, online, um, well, not just online, but uh, the smaller institutions. And I've really enjoyed also, for example, the, uh, the punk gallery, uh, online presentations and I really love Upstream's uh, online exhibitions and presentations and I would like to see many more of those and so that's what I wanted to talk about. Uh, the reason I um, invited Nancy and uh, Vinnie is because um, I very much like 
their approach to net art. Uh, both of them are radical in their own way. Uh, Nancy holds on to a certain, uh, I hope you don't mind me saying this, Nancy, uh, almost romantic 90s feel of, a, of a, an internet that can um, uh, be approached as, 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 as a movement almost, you know, so in, in her manifesto, she talks about how the internet needs to change in, uh, or needs to, or no, she talks about it as if it is an actor, you know, as if it is a person almost. So um, the good thing about that is that it helps us engage, that it makes us uh, enter the, uh, into a deeper dialogue somehow with uh, internet criticism. And with Vinnie, I'm just really amazed with um, the writing uh, she has done and also the work she has done in the past few years. Every now and then uh, something comes to, uh, to my screen, it passes by and um, I just had a look at her website in preparation of this and it turns out I have even missed a lot. So <laughs> I hope you'll please introduce more of your work to us tonight. But uh, the most important reason, of course, that I asked both of you is that you're both working with uh, code and coding in a very specific way. With uh, Winnie, it's her um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a way of dealing with code that uh, reaches back to the the early software art period, I suppose. It reminds me very much of uh, Graham Harwood's uh, Lung's poem, London. The class, the class library and also London one as well, right? Ex yeah. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yeah. In uh, which you can read as a person, but which you can also play as an executable uh, code, uh, as, as a piece of software. And um, well, I guess I, should, I will just jump in and ask you, both my first question. And this is uh, to please introduce your work briefly and um, describe the projects that we focus on today. And I completely forgot to mention that with Nancy, the reason I asked her was uh, that she uh, has a project called Writing the Feminist Internet. So how does Vocable Code, Winnie, the project I asked you for, uh, fit into your overall practice? And with Nancy, how does writing the internet, the feminist internet uh, fit in your overall practice? Winnie, maybe you can- Yes, yes, yes. But first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, really an honor to be in, in this setting. Uh, and also like, because I have been early on reading a lot uh, of articles and books from Josephine as well. So I feel really honored to be, have a conversation with her. And also for Nancy, um, also this is like, it's, I find it so interesting that we share a lot of interest, but also we work in a, in a, in a different ways. I think we will hear a lot more about each other practice um, tonight. So so for me, uh, so in, in general, uh, I'm an artist, uh, researcher, as well as a coder as well. So I, I teach programming as well uh, in my daily job, right? So I have been really interested in, in code, in software, also in uh, the internet as a way. Also, I, I think it's also because I born and raised in Hong Kong. So why I, I emphasize this is because you know, right, Hong Kong is such a small city and everything has to be very compact and expensive. So I developed my artistic practice in, in this square. And I, I consider this square is my, is my space for working because it's low cost. And also I can do a lot of things and reach out to many people. So this used to be uh, my, my practice. So, and for tonight, uh, we are specifically focusing on the work called Vocable Code. I think it's uh, maybe it's better for me to just quickly uh, show you the work because I, I think it's important to get the context uh, of the work, all right? I'm going to share the screen now. Share screen. So, 
said, so, do, do, do. so I'm going to play for this work we've sung behind for just a short while, maybe uh, 15 seconds, so that you get a sense of like there are two panels here. And this side is, um, is the source code. Uh, where it is written in a particular form. It's like a poetry. I call this as uh, code work, um, which is very, is, is a popular term uh, in the field of electronic literature that artists and practitioners play with the language of code, seeing code as not just only communicating to the machines, but also communicate to the human. And then the other side is like different voices and statement. So, Mm -hmm. Can you hear the song? Oh. Then sing to our own tempo. Yes. Not you. Not now. Then sing to our own tempo. Fixing the binary. Constant, ephemeral, transformation. Queer. And queer. that means queer. That means queer. Rupture. Then sing to our own tempo. Not a manifesto. Lyrical. So um, for this work, um, there are different ways of looking at it. I call it as a vocal vocal because I'm very interested in voice, um, different kinds of voice, not necessarily human voice, but also computer voice in by playing a, a computer format, like a WAV file. So on this panel, like now my mouse is moving. Uh, so. These are the statements and voices that are collected from, I think more than 30 participants. So they help me to fill the sentence with the starting words queer is, and then they continue to line. For example, like queer is fixing the binary, like queer is intricacies of gray, or queer is forgetting to be a no. So um, I collect a lot of these voices. And then this panel is more like structuring um, this, um, uh, these voices and statement. And for this particular version of the work, uh, this can be, this is also under a live coding framework as, as well. So you can like simply, uh, for example, like I change the background, um, like to red, for example, that it will change immediately. Um, I also consider this as thinking as a tool as well uh, on how people actually tinkering uh, with the work. Um, so what, what, what I, I, I think what is interesting about this work is, is that um, it is deliberately written in a way that is human readable and as a poem. So the most, um, I would say the most, my favorite line uh, of this work is um, this line. So I try to perform a little bit like, if gender equal absolute to speaking code, Queers, who is queer, I am making statements. So the whole piece uh, is the whole source code is like means to be something that you can perform line by line. And each line or, or the writing is like always in tension between like computational uh, aspect as well as like a human speech, speech like qualities in order to um, um, produce this kind of poetic aspect of both the source code as well as the executable version that you can see immediately. So in a way, um, this work is more like to think about, um, not necessarily uh, just about like electronic literature, but also thinking about what does it mean by critical interface? What does it mean by queer the computation? What does it mean by queer code? And to what extent this is queer? How is it executed in terms of not the, not the executed version, but in terms of how code has been structured in a very crazy way, because it's not a usual way of writing code and, and trying to escape some of the binaries um, logic that I have implemented. But this maybe we can talk about it later on. Mm -hmm. Pretty much a general introduction on, of the work. Yeah, thank you very much, Vinny. Yes. Nancy, can you do the same? Can you? <clears throat> yes, I can. Um, well, uh, thank you. But thank you so much, Winnie, because there, you know, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of crossover in um, the way that we approach uh, 
code, an executable code, um, in, in that sense that I also see uh, code as, um, well, you know, it has a, a poetic and a, and a theatrical function, you know, as in it is a, you know, it's, a, it's an act and it's some form of kind of incantation as well. Um, so I was thinking of, well, a few different projects, although um, I, I can mainly talk about writing the feminist internet um, today, but I thought I would also just share um, one of, um, if you can see it, the works um, I recently did, but this is an archive um, of this work um, called Cosmotechnics using, um, actually it was modified a version of uh, time-based text, which was modified by uh, Jeremy uh, Dynabolic. Um, so it's recording the keystrokes. So in the sense that um, you are, um, it, it is a form of live coding, but it's also a scripted um, piece that has a theatre element to it. So there's a thinking about the dramaturgy and also I am there in the uh, theatre uh, performance space or the gallery um, typing live, which may be simply um, the projection of my live typing, or it may be um, typing executable code, but what you're seeing now is the um, the output of one of those uh, iterations. So I, I think um, in terms of um, in terms of practice, in terms of practice uh, with code, um, at, for me, I'm very much coming to the work from performing art and. Uh, the ephemeral the ephemerality of code and the the shape sh shifting uh, abilities of code or to be able to um, modify on the fly is I guess what attracts me coming um, actually from being trained uh, in dance and being able to unpack meaning. Yeah, on, on, well, on the on the fly, but also um, to show that yeah, there there yeah, uh, computation doesn't necessarily have to be so deterministic, um, and at the same time, um, what yeah, um, so that would be uh, some of my practice. Uh, in regards to uh, writing the feminist internet, which is a kind of a nascent uh, project, I was working uh, for a while on some working points, um, which are very um, in process. And um, I will go to that in a minute. Um, but what, what you're also seeing here is, you know, you're seeing this combination of um, you know, uh, typical command line computing mixed in with um, poetic uh, poetic statements in that sense. Um, so I also, uh, am I still sharing my screen? No, no, no. Oh, good. Thank goodness, because I, I stopped sharing it and I was on the wrong page. Excuse me. Um, so I think I'll move to some other projects in a minute. But, um, you know, that's a little bit of an introduction uh, to my work. I, I um, yeah, thank you. Well, uh, I find it uh, mm. interesting to see that you both work, your, your works overlap a lot, uh, but uh, this, this difference in space experience, um, it's funny that I still, uh, Am I well? Anyway, uh, there's, there's a difference in space experience in the sense that so Nancy, you uh, for you, you have this stage feeling. It's a more spatial feeling of what uh, coding used in. It's used in uh, 
live performance is used uh, as, as a thing that really touches on uh, real world experience maybe, whereas uh, where Winnie was talking about a small screen, which is her work field. So when, for you, how, how uh, I'm diverging from the questions a little bit now. Uh, uh, <laughs> how does, how does uh, your code work relate to the real world? Because you have this vocable code and I thought it was a lovely poem actually, especially the, the sentence that you lifted out. Um, how do you see it perform in a real world? Because what, what I found very strong about that project for Couple Code is also the workshop settings in which it is developed. Yeah, yeah uh, so for this work, I actually have a lot of different versions. Uh, the one that I just show you is more like for, I would say it's more for educational purpose. It's for like teaching, uh, programming, or this kind of feminist, or to think about feminist software actually, in the settings of like workshop or classroom setting. But I also have two other versions of Vocable Code. One is more insulation setting, which is uh, like in a bigger scale, in a, in a gallery space. And then the other version is a live performance version uh, that I developed with Jack Cox. And we have developed uh, the book um, uh, with the publisher called Double Decker. Um, let's see if I have something here. Oh, yeah. OK, yeah. All right, so this is the, the book that we have developed. It's something like a score, you know, a script uh, that's for performer to, like two performer to perform vocal code. So on the one hand, uh, we will read aloud the source code uh, partially. And then we also have some kind of contextualization or thinking around like different aspects of code as like around a 30 minutes um, performance. So we frame it as a lecture performance um, in six parts, right? <laughs> um, so we have also published this um, and it's also widely available uh, online as a PDF as well. Um, so in that sense, I do not really see it as so much detached from the real, real world. In a way, I do see online is also a real world. It's, it's a different forms of world, maybe. And I do enjoy performing this work with physical audience. Uh, and I did a workshop that, allowed, that asked every um, participants to play around with this code aloud with me, like jamming, you know jamming the music, you know, but jamming the code, you know. So I find um, this is super interesting to opening up uh, like different ways of approaching code. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think uh, Nancy's remark about computation not having to be so deterministic actually opens up the discussion to uh, queer code and feminist code uh, also as a place that, that doesn't necessarily involve, well, something like identity politics, but it's really about um, making code and software do something and perform in ways that uh, enable us to live different kinds of lives with the technology that we use. So um, this is why I also found uh, that we, um, that even though maybe it seems like we are just talk, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not I can cut in there if you want. Yeah, do that. But all right. No, it's fine. I mean, the idea that, yeah, that 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 code or the computation is not necessarily as you are picking up, yeah, back again on the deterministic level that it's actually, you know, some it's an incantation. So when Winnie was talking about executable code and showing that you can execute code not necessarily for uh, only utilitarian uh, reasons, but you can, you, know, you can, it's a form of active pro poetry. Uh, I often call my works co-baits, they seances, you know, the idea that, you know, there, there is some, something that you, I mean, you know, yes, this very romantic notion, um, you know, unfortunately, maybe, or fortunately, um, I'm often, uh, uh, was it uh, possessed by? But the idea of this, you know, seance or the idea that you're summoning some, you're you're a medium in in that sense, and not necessarily oh for this source or in a genius way, but that you're actually putting something into motion that you're not 
exactly sure what is being set into motion, but it is actually, um, you know, summoning some kind of, um, it, it, it is creating some kind of action uh, which you, which is indeterministic, which you're not actually sure the animation of text or the executable code, uh, what, what, what is being spoken um, in, in that sense, the idea that you're not necessarily in control of, or we are not necessarily in control of every single thing we do. And you know, I guess it, I, I feel uh, terrible to, um, as a feminist, to quote Kitler, but you know, he also says we, our writing, um, <clears throat> we do not know what our writing does. You know, this this idea. So I think that um, the idea of choreographing <clears throat> choreographing code and the idea of the terminal space as a black box and as a as a theatre space and a computer as a theatre machine is something that I. Um, I'm, I'm very, um, I, I've been thinking about for, for quite a while, right, you know, this kind of den of veracity. So this, you know, and, and, and another way which I, which I love about your work, Winnie, is that you're showing, um, and I think it's important to do that too, you're also showing the code along with the output, which also, um, you know, demystifies this kind of, uh, you know, black box or this, you know, input out, output characteristics that, um, you know, you, you're showing that it's actually not as intimidating um, to to program. Um, you know, creative code can be very creative, and and that it's not um, as something for you know a, a very partic a particular a uh, few which you know it, it is currently you know when we talk about algorithmic bias and so on right there's often often a particular dominant type of person that is doing the programming right that the the coding those algorithms and so on right and the, the, these conversations are are opening up this is also the question actually I, I want to ask you um, as well, Nancy, is like, I, I mean, for, for the work like feminist uh, writing one, is it um, more like you are performing it or you're performing with the audience? Or is it this is something that is a set is, a, is in a workshop setting that you uh, collaboratively write together with participants? How, how, how does it uh, work in, in, the, in the presentation uh, format? Okay. Um. Well, <clears throat> um. I'm actually sorry. I did that because I've got a few. Um. I can share one moment. Um. Because because you also mentioned right, it's like um this kind of like thinking about code as sim okay. sim simply like people think about it as very alienated. So this mis this misfiring like this kind of um. Uh, deterministic uh, or, or the black box idea. So I'm also thinking about like uh, in in this work is like how how does it also play out in your work as well? Oh yeah. Well, at the moment I'm I'm actually um, for I've had these working points which I um, after talking and um, being involved with um, many different um, collectives over the last almost two decades, um, I kind of was reflecting on the fact that um, and it, a lot of, um, obviously, when you're doing um, creative coding or, or digital literacy outreach, um, you know, there's a lot of politics that, that come with that. Mm. And um, I was um, involved with the the Gender Changes Academy, which was a grassroots kind of female-led skillshare meetings um, um, and events, uh, which began at the end of the 90s um, in Amsterdam. And then um, there was the Eclectic, Ke Eclectic Tech Carnival that uh, came from that, which was more like gender changes on the road. And, um, you know, there was a big... It, big group of people or, or women and women only events where we would, you know, basically teach, uh, well, first and foremost, um, it wasn't necessarily about the software, it was about opening up the computer and naming the parts and then putting it back mm -hmm. together again. So the idea of 
kind of deconstructing the computer, uh, demystifying the computer, um, naming the parts and, you know, putting back together again in the day where you could actually get computers that you um, could uh, open. Um, I mean, obviously you can still now, but they're, they're you know, presented more as a given that, that they are closed. Anyway, the idea is what I'm trying to say is that um, it was very much about uh, technical skills share and the idea that the gender changer was actually a piece of hardware that you would get, you know, that changes the gender of the, the computer, of the pins. Right? Oh, yes. And yeah. the, you would get the gender changer, which I um, don't have near me, um, after you had completed the hardware demolition and reconstruction course. Anyway, um, but then this uh, turned into these festivals where, you know, there would be uh, Linux sysadmin skills and then, you know, people could be knitting in the corner and the idea that mm. you could have a lot of, um, you know, people screen printing someone, uh, you know, uh, showing that you could actually use non-proprietary text editors for it. So there was a lot of... Um, I guess, yeah. Um, education going around. Educa yeah, educa yeah, education and skills share, but the idea that these were all equal and, and valid um, mm -hmm. things. So the idea um, when you say writing, you know, I, I guess I, I made some working points uh, because often in these uh, events, um, People also wanted to talk now and again about the politics, but then the event would end it, end up these circles being uh, talk about oh why why women only and what you know and then when you kind of get caught up in the theory, then you kind of um, which is also important the the discourse and the discussion, but the idea of experientially learning and just focusing on say the the task at hand to open up the the computer and name the parts um, sometimes actually performs the the politics rather than literally mm. discussing all the time, right? So there mm. was this this idea of experiential learning together, mm. um, which sometimes opens up uh, conversations and and perspectives that you would not necessarily um, think about, and the idea that you uh, were watching, um, understanding the space and who's taking up that space more than someone else because you've all been, um, you know, so all of these things get played out in um, the practice of focusing on the technology rather than kind of getting caught up in, um, I guess, identity politics uh, and um notions of uh, power and so on, because everyone, uh, the events were quite diverse in terms of class, gender and race, because we would do it in a lot of different countries, which was a really nice way to kind of, um, I guess, uh, all join together on a common thing, as in opening up a computer or something. So anyway, so to move on to this, uh, writing the feminist internet, um, where, uh, which is quite the opposite of what I was talking about. Um, I just thought of these working points in terms of there is uh, a group called. Um, I mean, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of groups at the moment working with this idea of a feminist yeah. internet. Um, one moment. Yeah. Also, feminist servers. The, um, you know, these kind of things as well. Yeah, it seems like uh, yeah, super so, intriguing. Yeah. I find. Uh, exactly. So the Gender Changes Academy, one of the side projects is Sister Server, which yeah. um, is also um, a very big part. You know, so there was the system administrator, the, the idea that you have these autonomous servers that you are serving the, your community, not necessarily as consumers, but the idea that you have a place to experiment with. And it's a safe space, mm. but um, uh, which is important, right? So the idea that just to even um, explain to maybe the next generation that um, 
or the next generation, or, you know, people that uh, aren't necessarily uh, initiated that, you know, underneath, um, you know, underneath the graphic user interface is a terminal where you can, you know, write write code and things like that. Or the idea that you you don't, if you want to have, um, you, don't, you don't need to use a third party to, to store your data or to um, publish yourself on, on the internet and things like this. Um, so, yes, yeah, sister server and these feminist servers come out of that. Anyway, there was basically um, the um, association, the APC, um, the Association of Profe uh, Association of, uh, what is it? Excuse me. Anyway, they, excuse me, I forgot it. I, I know it was APC, terrible. Uh, the Association of Progressive Communities, which uh, does some amazing work with gender, ICTs and uh, access and all of this um, mm. internet rights. And mm. it's very um, mm. grassroots activist. But I, I come personally, I come from a performing arts uh, tradition and I... Um, I definitely agree with uh, a lot of um, what they do. So they made these um, principles of the internet. And I thought, well, actually, I would like some principles of the, um, and I'm still trying to figure out, principles of feminist internet art. And then I thought, well, maybe, you know, obviously this is a collaboration and I will invite some other uh, women and people who are interested to come and um, help me write these working points. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. at the moment, and then I, at first I called it yeah, film, like feminist internet law manifesto, 10 working points for the 21st century. But is it, you know, and then I thought, well, but it's actually at the moment because it's working points, so it's all about writing the feminist internet. And the idea that it's writing, that it's in process because it is a process, it, there's, there's never one uh, static end because things are always uh, changing that we have to address, which is what I like about um, code work and code practice so much that you can actually tweak it. Um, you, you, it, is, it is malleable. It's not um, mm. Mm. written in stone, uh, so to speak. For so, a, uh, hello, oh. I cut in for a moment. Uh. No. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I didn't know I could talk so much. Excuse me. <laughs> I felt like my microphone maybe had muted or somehow. <laughs> yeah, we, we couldn't hear you actually before. We, we, we I, I just saw you waving. Yeah, I thought let's just wave. Uh, but anyway, uh, so um, to, to latch on to Nancy's mentioning of uh, writing different types of code in a diff feminist internet and so on. Um, you... Uh, in your text around vocal code was saying that you were trying to escape the binary logic inherent to computation in a t an attempt to queer the code, as it were. So can you tell us a little bit about how you tried to do this, what worked, what failed, and what maybe surprised you? So what's really the potential? Is there a potential for playing with this binary logic at all? Yeah. Then I have to share my screen to get into the concreteness of, of it. So um, I am trying to explain in a way that is uh, everyone is a non-coder, all right? Uh, because I, I like this kind of accessibility of, uh, you know, how we can imagine uh, the code differently. So in terms of like, we, we often hear about like code is like one and zero, right? And also true or false, which is true. I mean, which is true in a sense that for, for computation, um, there is certain kinds of type that is bo in Boolean format. It's either true or false, right? You, you need to have this checking in order to proceed certain kinds of conditional checking, right? So then I have been thinking about, because when, when, when you say something like this is a pen, it is true that it is a pen. It's very absolute, I think. Absolute, <laughs> in, a, in a sense that you, it's, there's no other room for discussion, right? But when you say, when you put it differently, when you say, um, this is a pen, not false, right? So it's just simple manipulation, right? In terms of language, because I believe language is a political device. 
actually. I believe language matters in, in computation, even like this kind of very violent code, like a bot, like master and slave concept, you know. So that's why I think language matters, that we have to pay attention to language. You know? So here, like um, at the bottom of the, of the code, uh, I'm trying to think about like, how can I not to use, not to say explicitly something that is true, that is like I'm making an authority that this is true. You, you are a man, it's true. You are a woman, it's true, you know. Um, and then the other thing that I have been implementing is like decimal. There are so many decimal here, which is also kind of strange um, in coding context. Um, and I kind of like the poetic aspect of pronouncing is like random, 20.34387, comma, 35.34387. And everything when I put into number, it is dot .34387 as a way to think about what is a number, like what is decimal, what might be uh, between us, for example. And then the other aspect is, uh, if you are into coding, it is also very common to use X and Y, like a single X, single Y, uh, or uh, like using like one or zero as a way to check your program. So this is also another rule that I have to implement. Like it's a constraint for myself in terms of writing. Like, okay, if I don't use the conventional way of writing, how can I write it differently? So then I try to play around. It's also funny in terms of like speaking about the code. For making this work, I often have to struggle with like how to pronounce it poetically. So if you take this line, right? This stop x x x x x equal with slash 2.0 semicolon. So I, I kind of like this uh, repetition and also to emphasize like, like what does it mean by binary? What does it mean by number? What might be decimal? And there are a lot of things that I play out here, like um, trying to like um, thinking about the logic uh, differently. And even for this part, like just now I pronounced like gender equal absolute two. This is absolutely nonsense in terms of computer programming in computer science. In why? Because I don't really need to use this syntax at all. This syntax is absolute, which means like to take a, a, a number, like an integer. Uh, even I don't have this function, it, is, it still works. But why I put it here is because I find it so fascinating with this syntax, absolute. I, then I, I just think, oh, I need to think about how to use this syntax incorporate in my, in my code. So in that sense, um, it is written in like a lot of constraints but also a lot of ways to help me to, to rethink about how can I undo the way of writing code um, differently. So this is sort of like, I guess it's like to answer your question is how does that work um, exactly as the, as the code level. So I try to stop sharing my screen. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so you did this, in a work setting though. So did, did, did you get, how does that work? Because I understand that uh, a lot of software and code is, uh, is not something that you develop solitary. You know, you share, you, you, you collaborate with people. People come with suggestions, alter things and so on. Uh, did you notice that different people made different decisions in the querying of the code, let's say? Uh I actually have a lot of different, uh, and why this code put up on GitHub is also one of the reason is because I find is I never settle with this code, with this piece of code in a way, constantly I find, oh, there's something that I can change. Oh, there's something that I can actually speak more poetically and, and incorporate different things, such as like a for loop, for example, like it's a particular uh, structure in programming. And in the past, I just only know one way of doing a for loop. But just because I'm teaching programming, I thought, oh, there's also another way. And it's, it seems like it's more poetic to write in this way. So then I just change um, along the way. And if you ask what is work or what is fail or success, you know, I'm, I, I'm not sure how to answer this question in terms of failure, I, because I don't see failure. Um, it, it's an experimentation, it's, a, it's an exploration in, in different ways of possible 
thinking, you know. And, and so far, I don't receive any complaints, um, although people like my students find weird or strange uh, at the very beginning. Uh, but I don't really care how people think about how strange it is. Um, and, and I think this is the point, really, is, is to make binary strange is the point uh, for, for, for this uh, work. Mm -hmm. So what kind of reactions do you get on GitHub? Do, do you also get uh, animosity? Uh, not really. Uh, I think for posting on GitHub is is more like again. On the one hand, I subscribe to this kind of free and open source uh, movement uh, in order to like make my code transparent and also shareable. But also at the same time, is GitHub is such a programmer's uh, world, right? And I also want to intervene in a different ways. It's like like if I put like a code poem on GitHub. Okay, so I'm also making a tiny little changes um, in, in a way to, to, to think about code otherwise in a different context. And that's also the reason why this work has a lot of different version is also trying to see what forms of intervention uh, I might able to create. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one, one thing that uh, I noticed in the work of both of you is this, this focus on, there's this, uh, you share a uh, voice, there's, there's a voicing of a uh, different kind of voice in code, as it were. Um, so what's the relation between this voicing and the development of technology? And I'm, I'm thinking in particular of uh, Nancy's uh, manifesto, uh, the, the writing the feminist internet, uh, which is, um, uh, well, in, a, in there's a text next to it, Nancy, when you were just sharing the screen, we could see it, there's a text next to it, which has a lot of footnotes, uh, which lead to uh, texts that are critical of uh, who is building the software, who is the, who are the sysops of the internet, who are the system operators, who are the moderators, etc., etc., you know, that define the environment that we uh, live in and work in and, and exchange our thoughts in right now, uh, who, who determines, you know, how we do this. Um, so I see that both of your projects are, is a kind of counter uh, force against, or is uh, trying to be a kind of counter force against this, um, well, basically white male dominance of the internet. Hmm? Uh, how do you see it yourself? Because I, I, I'm not entirely sure when I was making the questions also how to talk about this thing of the female voice, because there is something uh, uh, somehow the female voice, the higher it gets, the less um, auth authority it seems to have in general, in society. There's this psychological thing about the female voice. Uh, that what do you mean about the higher? Higher? Mm -hmm. uh, a high voice has less authority than a low voice. Oh, okay. Oh, like, oh, oh, okay. Right. So, yeah. women are <laughs> um, than, than, than men. So, in general, they... Uh... So, that's why I like that you... That, that, Winnie has some female voices in uh, that read the text out loud on, in this uh, online version of the vocal code. Okay. But anyway, uh, let me see if I have another question for you that maybe uh, make a little bit more sense and is more easy to. Ask. No, that completely made sense. I just can't believe I didn't um, consider that really before. But yes, the high voice is mm, often equated with folly, which is interesting that I was I was thinking at first you meant more like in a um, position of power like high like um, well there was a many, more than 20 years ago I heard a I was at a talk by Koto Eshu in V2 uh, which was entirely about a certain way of using the female voice in um, got the name of the type of music that was really popular at London pirate radio stations at the time. It's a sort of dubstep kind of uh, music where they really liked to take samples of women singing and then 
turn up the pitch so that the female voice would get really, 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 really high and really fast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, so he gave a l- really long talk about this and never once mentioned uh, power relations between men and women. Mm. Means if you do that to, you know, what, what that high pitched voice would mean in terms of uh, looking at it from a feminist pr- perspective. But um, interesting, because yeah. Diamanda Galas comes to mind, you know, her, her work is very, it was seen in a very kind of gothic kind of, uh, you know, she's a soprano. Do you know who I mean? Diamanda Galas? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's. Yeah, I'm curious. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. She's an activist in her, but not in the in the te- technology technology and art sphere, of course. Um, mm. About art, uh, I wanted to ask both of you what it means for you to combine technology and art. What you can, you know, you're both a little bit activist, artist activists in the technological sphere. What does art bring to activism? Is there anything specific you could do there that art can bring to activism? That art, that, that for instance, um, can you reach people you will not reach otherwise? For example, I, I can try to tackle these questions. I've been also thinking about that as well. How does art um, open up? the way of how I work. So I would say, um, I, I think like working with art as a medium, it's allowed me to think and act otherwise in a normal way, you know, like in a way, be- because like, for example, like if you are in a design institution, if you are, because I have a background in information system in business, you know, under business faculty, and and these kind of steps, there are certain kinds of environment that not necessarily allow you to do things otherwise or go crazy or really stretching the technologies and to think about work with this, not from the perspective of utilitarian or efficiency or optimization, right? And as you, we might also aware, like when we talk about like design solution, like technical solution, it's often like this kind of mainstream, very capitalistic way of working with technology, right? So art allows me to actually slower the pace and really to think about what I'm doing, what is the medium, what is voice as respond to your earlier questions. What does it mean by unheard voice, marginalized voice, suppressed voice, and how everyone also like in my work, for example, how they actually perform, trying to perform, not necessarily like human perform the voice, but also how the code perform the voice and doing this kind of translation and, and to think through what is the implications of voice? What is the power um, uh, of voice? And I think like also like the one obvious characteristics of us, I think is like, we, we all have to, especially when we talk about feminist internet, I guess it's like, we all have a desire to make things happen, right? To, to change something, right? And we also have the desire to, to express. So when we think about like voice and language, right? So that this kind of like, like the performativity of language is also thinking about the actions. What, what is it acting, the, the language, how, how does it act, right? So, and I find this is quite an interesting thing that in the art space that allowed me to, to think differently and as well as like to try to put this work, not necessarily in art context, like in this setting, right? In this Zoom setting or in a workshop setting, or in a classroom settings, or in an art gallery and, and, and different settings. You know, sometimes I even like kind of, I, I, I forgot actually I'm doing art, you know, I'm not sure whether it's art or not art, you know. And I started to feel like maybe, maybe the function of art is allow, allow, allow I have the space um, to, to act and think otherwise. Mm-hmm. And how about Nancy? <laughs> Um, well, uh, what is the question again? Activism, art. Um, I, um, I avoid, and I think that's what I was talking before with the, um, I often avoid activist situations because I feel like 
there's all these implied rules and protocols uh, within um, particular circumstances and that I can be more effective in other spaces um, to create a change and to um, uh, so I, I feel like it's, it is something that I am committed to and it's about being but it's being um, com committed to the language uh, or the the field of what uh, where I'm working in to then be able to make um, uh, a l larger impact, I guess. Um, so in the sense of, um, oh, how can I put it? Um, maybe I'll just, like, I can, I guess in, in regards to, um, you know, collaboration and the idea of enabling, uh, enabling uh, the people or particular people that maybe wouldn't come in contact or wouldn't uh, or would feel intimidated with particular technologies or just trying to find different ways in to sharing information with um, people that are off yeah that would either feel intimidated or wouldn't uh, consider these um, the importance of let's say um, machine learning uh, in our society, right? So at the moment, if, if you're, you know, we, what you were saying at the start, Josephine, in regards to the, um, what this pandemic has seen, there's a lot of art institutions are finally uh, taking notice of the fact that there is the internet, but still not necessarily using it as a medium or using it as um, an art form and that you, you um, the idea that to bring these ideas uh, into 21st century art and culture, the idea that we are not just making pictures, the idea that, you know, uh, coming from performance art, performance art for me is first and foremost uh, a political space anyway. Um, it, as a occupation or that, um, you know, I, you know, I don't feel like I actually chose that, but that's another story. But um, it's not something you choose. But either way, the idea that um, in our machine learning age, you know, how computers as theatre machines can be read through uh, more um, elation, a serendipity, um, and, you know, as Winnie was saying, thinking things otherwise, but, you know, the idea is um, it, it may be important to understand, it's, it's about literacy, so coming from uh, dance, it's a, a, when you're a, we're a dancer, you understand your body a, a lot, you understand the kinesthetic physiological processes because you want to be able to understand the language of what what you are doing so when I started as a performer to bring computer or working with with software and hardware I also wanted to understand what those systems and processes were so that I so that it would I could in I could control it or inscribe it because these things that you practice every day inscribe you so every day you know if you went to the gym you're you're seeing this measurable phys physio physical effect so these things have physiological effects so understanding how um you know preemptive kind of algorithmic culture or you know the these um, devices that preempt our habitus uh, to understand and to use them against their grain is is really important and to share that literacy to share that digital literacy with um, a wider community because as I don't know uh, in Australia especially there's a, a very um, emerging uh, divide in regards to um, you know digital literacy um, in, in remote and regional areas divide yes okay yes yes and I know that's an old, it's kind of like an old uh, 
argument, but it's still a very emerging problem, uh, at least in, in Australia. Um, and, and I can imagine other places too. On you, because uh, um, you mentioned that you didn't have a choice uh, going into the arts. M maybe you can dwell a little bit on your family history here, which I find uh, absolutely fascinating family history. Um, uh, I'm a bit jealous even. Um, and, ah. and then maybe uh, you, from there, I, I find it interesting that you, um, well, let, let's just go to your family history first and then move on for, from that. Okay, Ooh. all right, we'll uh, quickly, uh, Ooh. where do I? <laughs> for, for, sorry. Yeah. No, that's fine. Um, well, I can uh, basically, oh, I better get the full screen first. Oh no, here we go. Um, well, one moment. Um, oh, well, my, my great, great grandmother, uh, was a, uh, she called herself the, um, the, the only lady professor in Tasmania. So this was, this poster you're looking at is from 1877. Um, and she, um, was a mesmerizer, so involved in the, the spiritist uh, movement. Um, and at the time, um, which which was interesting because that was, uh, Australia was colonized um, in 1788. So you could imagine, um, obviously there was some very radical and sophisticated practices going on for 40,000 years before that, but uh, when- um, well, So was she- only lady professor in Tasmania, is that your great, great that's what she well, that's what she called herself. So in 1877, as if you um remember, like this was the world where women um were hardly even allowed to go to university. So it was a very bold that was her, her act, you know, of combining it was she was kind of I think, you know, how she was presenting herself. I mean, I don't actually know if she was a professor as in the way we understand professors now, but you can see she's um, obviously um, combining vaudeville and kind of science, right? This, uh, she'll, if you can see the celebrated magician of the age will perform the most wonderful sleight of hand tricks, which will astonish the audience and the talented lady will appear where no one should miss the opportunity of witnessing her astounding performances and you know obviously that it was combined with vaudeville but this idea uh from my research because this is the only poster i have um and i've actually got the poster on the wall this is a, um, a scan of it um i got it archived uh at the time the, the mesmerizers were you know they would um you know, talk obviously, to, well, they would talk to um, people in other times and, and spaces as a part of a performance routine. But the idea that she's mixing kind of this uh, high, high class professor in with the, this kind of vaudeville, I, I find um, really, really interesting and um, well, bold. But at, at the time, what I'm uh, 1877. Yes, it was obviously, um, you know, the time of when the, the, the suffragettes and uh, it were and very differently because Emma Goldman wasn't a part of the suffragettes, but the idea that uh, women were uh, fighting for the vote, the first wave feminisms and so on uh, in Tasmania, which is an island down the bottom um, of the southern hemisphere, because uh, it was... Um, quite remote. I think that there was a lot of radical, we, we uh, well, as a colonised Anglo-Saxon colonised uh, space, we uh, here, uh, and I say we as in the um, colonisers, uh, had a more radical, we weren't, we weren't bound by Victorian conventions as much as say, um, perhaps, uh, other colonised places closer to uh, and imperialism were, yeah. So that was this is uh, yeah my my great great uh, grandmother that 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 was that poster yeah. Um, but my 
you know, I have a tradition in, in the theatre um, and my, hang on, I just try and show, my grandmother was, um, a, oh, here we are. Oh, oh, excuse me. Um, can you see that? No. 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 Oh, so excuse me. I was like, excuse me. That was an apparition or a machine. Yeah. Can you see now? No. Yes. Yeah. I am sharing the screen. Maybe I'll leave and come back again. Well, anyway. Um, anyway, I was just going to show the pictures. Send me a link to the text uh, called, with a, with a question in the title, is the fourth wave of feminism digital? That was mm -hmm. the title of the piece. Um, so is it, is the fourth wave of di uh, feminism digital or is that wishful thinking? I'm obsessed with showing this picture now. Anyway, that's my, my grandmother with her record dress. Can you see that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So is the fourth way that um, I will answer that first? I believe it. it I believe so. Um, I, I like the proposition by um, the person who asked the question. Um, Raka Johns, who says, if the fourth wave of feminism is going to be digital, then we need to understand about uh, accessibility and um, digital literacy and it, its situated context and the idea that um, we need to understand, you know, uh, the tools of production and and uh, pay attention to to the fact that um, that there can be uh, you know that pay attention to the fact that there is this um, uh, divide and that we we must share the alternatives in regards to um, how that these things can be accessed how these computational um, processes uh, can be uh, shared, I think, and that's I think what Winnie and I, um, in in different ways, are, are working uh, towards in terms of you know experiential pedagogy and experiential learning. Um, and if I go to um, say writing the feminist internet, which I didn't really show yet, which is a nascent uh, project, um, which I'm sharing now. I think can you see it? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the working points for um, the working points of writing the feminist internet, which are in process, as uh, if what you can see here is from an event that I did in collaboration um, with about 30 women for a Next Wave Festival in collaboration with a a duo called Make and Make or Break, but then we invited uh, other women or people, humans, to come and be involved. It wasn't a women-only uh, event to write in to the text, to write into these working points. Um, and as you can see here, in, in in regards to voices, so each color represents a different voice. So, as it says up the top, you people can overwrite, delete, transform, distill, edit, correct, challenge, echo, duplicate, uh, summarize, nuance, and can't. And uh, at the moment, I'm trying to think through: um, uh, is this particular text going to now be worked on further or should we start again from those working points um, and see how they um, play out right so what you can see is you know we can see how this um, develops over over time um, over a series of two hours and um, people writing writing in into the text um, but you know going back to the is uh, the fourth wave of um, feminism digital. I would say that, um, so what you're seeing here is, uh, uh, I would say that yeah, the, the thing is about the feminist waves, I think they're all um, not in a linear 
you know, you can, I think you can be second wave and fourth wave at the same time. Um, <laughs> and, and what do you think, Winnie? I think it's like, uh, I, I, I just want to add one point, I guess, is, I guess this is also important. If it is about the digital, then we need to question about the power structure of the infrastructure. And this possibly yes. related to what you mentioned about literacy, right? Digital literacy that I think we are yeah. sort of at some point in different ways working with that. Um, and also to think about in terms of digital infrastructure, uh, what who, who has the right, right? Who has the ownership and who has the access and who are able to modify and contribute, right? So these are, the, I think it's like, a, it's like a general feminist questions, but but in terms of like this kind of digitalities, like a different material, different affordances, and also different power dynamic as well as we can see different platforms, like for example, Zoom, right? Is is one of the yeah. one of the example, right? Then why, for example, the questions then then we'll raise would be like why free uh, Zoom um, software they are not entitled having like end-to-end -end encryption while just only paid version who is entitled so who decide um this kind of end-to-end -end encryption security as as a mm -hmm. privilege feature but not to the general right so i yeah. i think as the core of the feminist um perspective is is how could we question um, this kind of power structure. So you're meaning security is a privilege. So understanding encryption and understanding encryption yeah, keys. Yeah. Yeah. Is, I, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this seems what, like what Zoom has been suggesting, right? Because like security is is not something that is included in the free version of Zoom. I'm just posing an example, you know. Like, but while yeah, no, if I you are you if you are paying for like a like some institution paying for Zoom, then they are entitled having this kind of uh, end to end encryption. So this implies that there is something privilege is a features that is just only mm. for certain kinds of people right but not this is yeah. something that is important for all right yeah. exactly but then if you share if you have these events where you have a more experiential learning then people often say oh what is this oh this is is this like google and you and you can say well yes actually it is but it's called etherpad and it, and it, you know the idea and i run it on my own server so therefore uh, i have um, autonomy on my my own data to some to some extent, and the idea that you can share other alternatives, you know, that you can say, well, actually, there's something called Jitsi because everyone, you know, is uh, kind of just taking these tools as a given, um, but uh, with just assuming, oh, we'll just use Zoom, oh, we'll just you know, use these softwares, yes, without ever questioning the in, um, embedded uh, politics within the, within them. And I, I think um, in a sense, what I'm trying to say is I like doing these collaborative events because these conversations come up, but they're not necessarily saying, oh, you, um, you, you know, you, you can't be involved unless you have, you know, um, a GPG key and uh, you know what I mean there's, yeah. there's all of these kind of um, uh, politics around encryption well as well right even the crypto parties that were um, coined by Asher Wolf um, which was the idea that you know people would understand about encryptions and share share keys um, became quite a big um, political a debate, right, when she wrote uh, Dear Hacker Community, uh, we have to talk because she talked, she discussed about the fact that, you know, there, there in any, um, you know, especially in this, say this, you know, the geek community, there, there is all these implied rules and protocols that, um, it, that are important to dismantle. And that's what I um, definitely enjoy doing. A lot, actually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can I take over? So maybe that's where my activist is. I will not share screen now, but I was just showing some of the examples. It's beautiful, actually. Wonderful to look at. Thank you for that. That was really wonderful, actually, that you brought that up in the end. Uh, I want to 
end with a, a final question from my part. And then if there are any audience members left with questions, uh, they can raise them. Um, so how, how, how do you plan to develop your work? Well, how do you see your, the future of what you're doing right now? Or is that something that is too big a topic for the end of this evening? Are you referring to the specific work like vocable code or fem feminist writing, or you are speaking about like a general art practice? Anything you want to add. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I can start first. All right, Nancy. Uh, I think in terms of vocable code, I'm now, I, I think it's also related to the topic that Nancy talked about is the literacy and also like my concern in terms of, in terms of like questioning uh, interfaces of platforms and infrastructure. So I'm currently working on the book project, uh, which is more pedagogical um, perspective in introducing like vocable code or other uh, critical software artworks um, to arts and humanities, not necessarily just only to arts, but I think we have to broaden up like even for those maybe who are studying like art history or studying like I don't know like media studies or, or other areas of humanities um, or maybe even computer science. Um, I mean like there's different ways of thinking about technology. There are ways of questioning um, the power dynamics of infrastructure. So I think right now or in the coming years, I have been working on, on this part. So that's also the reason why sometimes I find artwork is, is also in, is queer the artwork as really an artwork or is it a tool? And where is the in-betweenness between like as a tool, as an artwork or as, as, as an object of, of study? Yeah. Okay. Nancy, future? Plans. Oh, future plans at the moment. Um, this writing the feminist uh, internet uh, working points will be um, happening for the Hackers and Designers Summer Academy in regards to their event called Network Imaginaries, which is in the end of July. Uh, and the date is TBC because I have a meeting with them in about an hour. Um, so... <laughs> I, I'll let you know, but the, the uh, Network Imaginaries event is between the 20 and 25th of July and um, people will be invited to come and uh, help write the, the feminist internet and there will be um, in instructions for this uh, session. The previous one I showed was a two hour session um, yeah, in response to this draft 10 working points and it's working towards a manifesto, but at the moment it's in working, uh, working point uh, phase and, um, and maybe it will always be, but yes, so that, that's forthcoming. Um, and I am, yeah, it's nice and, and, it, and it's emerging, but there will be the, the, the document and the archive on um, sitting on the, the feminist server, which you saw uh, before that, um, that uh, yeah. So that's, that's one of the things forthcoming. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank so you so much, much for inviting us. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks for being here. I'm mm. gonna have a, yeah. so thanks Josephine and Vinnie and Nancy. And I was actually thinking it's, it's interesting because I started this channel like in April, uh, just when the, quarantine um, kicked in with a question like, do we need to be able to hack as a modern survival strategy? And I think um, tonight uh, really puts a big emphasis on that from queer and feminist art practices and the importance on education and literacy that you've kept on uh, bringing to the fore really strengthened me in this, um, yeah, given this answer. So thank you for that and pointing that out. And now I'm gonna quickly have a look at the chat. There was a question already very long ago but I didn't want to interfere the talk and that is for Nancy and if you could talk a bit more about the code as a theater machine that's a big topic but um oh. you could... okay um if you still have the energy for that <laughs> no no I'm just trying to work out where to start um well the idea that the computer is a theater machine and I think that um 
you know, theatre, we, we've seen, you know, there's there's so many um, equivalences. You know, we have scripts, right? You you we have speech acts. I often um, make a script. So for when I'm uh, writing it or doing any kind of performance, I always uh, you know write a script. But that might have lines of code in it uh, or not. I just see that at, you know there's there's the black box, right? We have the space of the black box. There's the terminal space which is very um a, a potent space like uh the black box in a in a theater uh, space or in a in a gallery space there's you know it, it is a space where you can um bring bring things to work to life and make make things happen and the idea that you're thinking about the the mise-en-scene and the frame and the idea that programming uh, has these uh, recursive functions and this idea of miss miss on a bim, the idea of this this void and this idea of um, recursivity, um, and you can see that in uh, at least in the history of um, you know Western theatre in in regards to um, the Shakespeare or the idea that actually uh, if you think about the um, troubadours, say in the 17th century, before before the internet, that would be how they would, um, it, it, at least in in, well, there, there's many cultures that you know are roaming gypsies. That that's how they communicate particular knowledges um, and and spread propaganda as well, right? So it was an, you know the idea of of rumors and um, uh, well mystery and and who is the author and all of these kind of um questions that uh, um come up when you're thinking about uh computer culture and i mean nowadays it, it, it's uh not as common but uh, in the 90s you know if you were to um you all had usernames and characters, but you you would never reveal who you really were in these kind. You know, it was very much a performance, and and we've seen that a lot. Um, uh, you know, the idea that, uh, yeah. So I think computer culture and theatre culture actually are, are, are much more intimately intertwined than um, is often. Uh, spoken about and that's something that um, is very much at the heart of my research. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I don't that. know if that answers the person's question. But. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it does and it's interesting because it like before that there was Martine Adam uh, making a, a thumbs up for you and I think what you say also relates to some of the practices. She was of course one of the first artists making this avatar and not like not avatar but making this online persona and not revealing who was behind for a while, but she also keeps on talking about the performativity of, of code reenacted on the screen. So there's also this theatrical way of looking at code from her perspective. Uh, and then I think often when people talk about performance, they say it in a derogatory sense, but I think they're actually meaning posturing, which is something very different. Yeah, yeah for sure. And. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, Khabi, thanks you for uh, answering her question. And then there's another question um, that is, are your works exhibited in a physical setting and how do you approach translating them from a computer screen to that? Sorry. Is this to me? To I, 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 It's not um, said to who it is directed, but I think Winnie, Winnie, it's, I think Winnie you can answer that for sure. Hmm. How can... Um, so I'm, I'm most, I mean, in terms of the development of, of the work in particular vocal vocal in different versions, is really depends on, like, like especially the web version, I, I really develop with the mindset, uh, with the pedagogical perspective. So it's like, there's also some kinds of like, I, I want to make sure um, the participants or the students or anyone, when they get online, they, they are able to see the two side, side by side as not like privileging the interface rather than the source code or privileging uh, the other one. You know, it's really making the claim, uh, the argument that, that they are both 
sort of like a critical interface as Sonpo uh, talk about it. Um, so this is like the most important essence uh, of, of the work to think about, start to think about like, like whether there's a hierarchy and what, what might be the black box. Right? So the physical setting is, is more uh, relating to like if, if the audience, because I've tried different versions in terms of the physical, I also record my own voice performing the whole poem. And then the, the audience can have like two headphones, one listening to, to, the, to, the, to the voices, and then the other one listening to my voice who performed the source code. Right? So it's more like thinking about what might be uh, an interesting experience uh, for the audience. And also because of the physical insulation setting, I also can incorporate a little bit more different things, not necessarily just only two screen, but also headphone and as well as like different kinds of instructions because I have used a lot of constrained writing and constraint or, or instruction in my work. Uh, constraints to the participants who record their voice because I asked them to just only think about a sentence within five words and they are allowed to like think about how to perform their own statement. You know? And in terms of my own constraint, when I have to write a source code, I also have a list of constraints as well. So, and I think this is also part of the process that is also very important to the work. Not necessarily you just see only these two interfaces, but the whole process that develop um, the ideas in order to, to, to get the idea of this kind of constraints writing, right? So, so I think it's slightly different purpose. Um, the, the online thing is more like, like it's also facilitating the audience to read the code and also to tinker it and also with the interactive element. But in a physical setting, there's no, um, it's more like, like a theater really, like to, to watch um, things going on and to try to create a space for the audience to make sense and interpret on their own. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And I see now that Nancy, the question was also um, directed to you, so it was for the two of you. So I don't know if there's something we Ooh, can tell. Um, um, Winnie's much better at uh, documenting her work um, than I. Than I. <laughs> uh, when I saw the vocal um, code, no, I, I, I was very. Um, you know, it takes a lot of effort because you're doing all of these iterations, right? So the archiving and, and the sharing um, of these iterations that are very ephemeral is um, very time consuming, um, but I, I don't mean to complain. But um, in, in regards to the, um, yeah, thinking about the audience is um, very, you know, a, a very important and, um, because I'm more, more coming from um, performance, I'm always starting with being in the in the space, but at the same time um, interacting, say, with with a um, a computer, uh, whether that's in a in a terminal space, that's a network space um, uh, on the internet, or more of a local area network. Um, it it just depends. Um, but the idea of um, well transmission in 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 a more uh, radical sense rather than a more ma mainstream broadcast broadcasting kind of um, standard is yeah I mean uh, yeah I guess I don't really know how to answer that question I think what at the moment I'm I'm thinking through how to archive a lot of the more uh, ephemeral works that have been installations and that have computational elements and then how to actually um, have another um, life um, on the internet. Um, yes. So. But speaking about this, this archive, I find it's also very interesting to think of because maybe it's also very much related to software versioning you know, it's also kind mm. of archive because like whenever you change mm. one line of code, it's, it can be a different version, right? Yeah. Or Facebook, yeah. they constantly update seamlessly. It's, it's like another version. But this versioning actually has a lot of political implications because versioning is also about changes 
it also about what decisions that you have made, either because of like maybe because uh, the uh, your operating system has upgrade and then your work doesn't work anymore, so you have to update, right? Yes. So this is one way yes. of of consequences and other consequences. Oh, okay, suddenly I have a new idea. I just want to add a little bit. I have a new voice uh, that I collect from the audience. I want to add, right? And every single step of versioning or archives actually has some kinds of traces. And I find that is so fascinating, uh, both in terms of software perspective and political perspective, I think. Yeah, I, I, I agree and I'm, um, I need, Yes, I think it's very important in terms of the digital literacy to really understand, um, you know, how to share your code and and do that on a repository like like GitHub, for instance. Um, and um, I you have done uh, your your versioning as well. That. I, I, I really find your your timeline is super fascinating. It's also like seeing the changes over time, isn't it? Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that yeah. Oh, that's true. Isn't the it Ethernet right? Pad, it has that yeah, nice yeah. function actually. Yeah. yeah. So I don't have to do that. Um, but in terms of, I guess, because uh, more coming from um, arts and performance art, I have a gallerist who are just continually. I mean, they never say that actually. But the idea is, you know, how to be able to um, share and distribute this work. Um, that that's always so ephemeral and as you were saying before Winnie you know it's all it's mainly about an experiment I don't make um I don't make work to to and and think about the artifact or the object that's going to be sold um but um the idea that there is a gallery that supports me that probably wants me to do that at some stage uh you know and uh, which is which is another consideration um and I am thinking through that uh, at the moment um, about yeah how how to um, yeah I guess distill these more these experiments that uh, this experimental approach which is yes all about unraveling these implied rules and protocols or um, unraveling particular constraints with maybe other uh, constraints or um, you know, using using these tools against the grain also um, makes them precarious and 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 ephemeral. So, how to be able to um, share that? And, and yeah, because there's so yeah, there's so much. Um, it's, it's a long conversation. Yes, in in regards to updating and 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 software and so on. But then again, if you think about uh, the you know the computer terminal and and you know just simple scripting um, that really hasn't changed, right? I mean, what your programming, Winnie, is do, constantly change. <laughs> yeah, constantly yeah, changing, new but it's but it's in a, yeah the libraries. That's true, but I guess it's not dependent necessarily on an operating system per se. Yeah, that luckily is, it's like more yeah. web-based. I mean, like on the web browser is 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 okay. Mm. But I have other projects. Depends on like Google API, uh, working with Collinear software. And it's like it's a yeah. nightmare. But it's also unfolding yeah. different politics as well. I find that is yeah so interesting. Yeah. So if you're using yeah, if you're using feeds from Twitter or something like that, then they will change the API, and then your project's broken, and then you, yeah, all of these. Kind of things, yeah. But I often do try to um, archive things on um, on my server on 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 the internet. It's just done in a very ho uh, someone described my work once. I think they were trying to be rude, but I quite liked it. Like, very spiritual and hokey, and uh, I like I quite like that. Anyway, <laughs> um, it's you know a little bit um. Uh, maybe naive and, and amateur the way that um, uh, I code and the way that um, you know my my website is, but I do believe it has my hand in it, and that that's for me really something quite important. I'm not interested in a slick. Uh, yeah, I, I want the human to be there, and and I think that's important. Yeah. And non-humans are good too. But. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the idea that you know 
that, um, you know, you're not using these off the shelf templates and, and things because that doesn't say anything to me. It's not necessarily, um, it's about using the me these mediums um, and being a medium as well for other voices or different voices. Mm. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. I think we could continue this talk for a very long time because I also made you think of course of um, of technological obsolescence and how that is also dictated by the industry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. When using for art practices, we are also dependent on a system that we don't want to be dependent on, but that's probably for another talk, yes. another Digital time. Obsolescence is very able. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Better>. yes. <laughs> But thanks for having us really enjoy the thank conversation. You. Yeah. Thank you very much for engaging in conversation. Uh, so and thanks for Josephine for inviting Nancy and Winnie um, with introduced me to a lot of new things. So yeah, thanks for that. Um, I'll be back next week with Willem van Wilde and Daniel de Sil, and they're gonna try to tackle the predator logic, logic of surveillance capitalism. And they will do so by um, pointing out the theoretical accuracy of a South Park episode. So oh, much coming right. up. Um, so stay yeah. tuned. <laughs> Hope to see you next week. And um, Winnie, Nancy, Josephine, thanks so much. Have a nice Thank you. evening. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.